Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Diane and my passion is painting and creating nature-inspired watercolours in my studio, which are easy for you to do too. I share all my paintings with you on YouTube and on our website, dianeanton.com, you can find free downloadable sketches for all the videos to help you make the most of your painting journey. And if you'd like a little bit more, we also have channel memberships with loads of perks for you to enjoy. So welcome on board, click subscribe and turn on notifications and let's learn to paint watercolour. Hi everyone, Diane here, welcome to my studio. Today we're going to paint some flowers and uh, first of all I'm going to set out some more of my uh, paints here and I've got the Paul Rubin's 36 set of fourth generation paints here which um, we did a video on that yesterday about uh, swatching it all out and uh, evaluating it and everything. Uh, but today I'm going to actually use them to do some painting. So I'm just going to top up my um, little blobs of paint here on my palette. And this, this is my traditional way of painting, my preferred way of painting actually, that I've used for a long, long time. Um, how long? How long exactly have I used this for? Uh, let me think, when did I first start this system? Oh, I can't remember. I'm sure it will come to me. Somebody suggested this idea, and I can't remember who now, but the idea is that you have a big white, this has gone a bit off colour, but uh, it's old. Um, I won't say like me, because people have started to say, stop saying you're old. Okay, all right then, I will. Um, anyway, it is getting on a bit and so it's lost its colour a bit. You know how white plastic goes but you can buy a white plastic tray fairly cheaply and um, I'm just putting out the colours. That was cadmium medium and we're coming up to Indian yellow here which looks like it might be quite a good colour for the middle of a flower, doesn't it? That one. And I'm putting out quite generous blobs because um, this paint was free. I didn't have to pay for it. And I might as well use it because I'm sure more will come where this came from. That's the trouble with doing this kind of thing. You need to buy a new studio before long because you're so inundated with samples of this and samples of that. You can't possibly use them all up. And uh, you begin to wonder where on earth you're going to sit down because your place is piled up with uh, all sorts of goodies. Um, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying. Uh, what was I saying? What was I saying? Yes. So... Um, my preferred way of painting because you can have all your paints out at hand, easily accessible, and you can just draw them into the middle of the palette to mix up your colours. So I'll show you how I do that in a minute. Um, we've got up to now transparent orange. Now that's, hang on a second, I've gone too far. That one, transparent orange. There we are. And I tried these out this morning before... I um, started recording and they are fine. They don't fade too much when they're dry. Um, and, oh yes, I, I should show you. I swatched these paints, just a sec, in the video the other day, we swatched out these ones. This is the uh, Paul Rubin set. And after I did that, I thought, well, I've been using Kiritaki paints for a long time uh, and a lot of people will have bought that set and I think it's incredibly good value for money because it's half the price of Paul Rubin's one. Um, and I thought, I wonder, I hope, that the colours are very similar. So I swatched out the, Paul, the uh, Kiritaki set on this piece of paper. And look, with the exception of two things, this is the yellow line. This is the Naples yellow from Paul Rubens, which actually is more like the Daniel Smith, um, uh, what's it called? A colour that a few people have mentioned that I ought to have. Well, that, that looks very similar to me. This is typical Naples yellow. Okay, so that one in the Kiritaki set is too pale. This is the way it should be. But the rest of them look very, very similar except Kiritaki don't have quite as many yellows. And then, looking at the reds, looking at the reds, these here and these here, 
very, very similar, and the blues as well. And then when we come down to this section here, the purples, the other blues, the greens, especially the greens, and the brown and the black. So if you've got the Kiritake set, you've basically got the same colours exactly as in the Paul Rubens set, with the exception of a couple of um, the yellows. Okay, yes, the Daniel Smith colour is Buff Titanium. That's the one I was trying to remember. Um, so, yeah, it's very similar to that. So now we're up to Burnt Sienna, and uh, we'll get out a little bit more of that one. And um, we'll keep going around, replenishing here. And this is a nice red. This is Pearl Red. Pearl Red. Can't wait to get out of the tube. And um, now quinacridone rose, yes. That's a good one for um, flowers. If you use that one fairly dilute, it comes out as a nice pale pink. Then we've got here perlin maroon, which is another red, which is very similar to alizarin crimson. If you've got that, then we've got Venetian red, which is a semi-opaque, brown with red undertone and if you mix that with a red that will give you a darker red and the same goes for Indian red. If you mix that with something like um, quinacridone red or perylin maroon you'll get a darker maroon colour and then here we've got quinacridone maroon which is the same pigment in it, it has the same pigment as quinacridone rose uh, and it paints out pretty similar, a little bit different. Quinacridone violet, which is what it says on the tube, so to speak. Um, that's the same as Windsor violet, pretty much. Then we've got um, cobalt turquoise, which you're not going to use that very often neat from the tube, but that mixed with the yellow is going to give you a nice bright green. Then we've got transparent turquoise, um, which is a green, basically. Um, followed up by cobalt blue, which is always a favourite blue for the sky and things like um, cornflowers uh, and other blue flowers that you might want to invent. This is azure blue, which is, as you know, something that looks like the sea, a kind of seaside blue. Uh, Berlin blue is almost like... Um, Prussian blue, but nowhere near as powerful or intense. It's kind of a bit like phthalo blue on a, a morning after the day before, so to speak. Uh, not terribly um, powerful. This is French blue, which is the same as French ultramarine. French ultramarine isn't quite the same as ordinary ultramarine. It's a little bit more delicate and feminine, really, I would say. This is brilliant blue violet. So this is violet. The pigment in that is the same as the pigment in the one next to it, except it's got a little bit of blue added. I don't know why, it doesn't seem to make much difference, but it is a little bit bluer. So it's basically blue violet is dioxazine violet, which is this one, plus a little bit of phthalo blue, I think it is. And now we're up to indanthrone blue, which is not a substitute for um, ultramarine. It's, I think it's a uh, much darker blue and more suitable for night skies than it is for um, ordinary skies. I would not use that instead of ultramarine. Instead of ultramarine, I would use cobalt blue or at a pinch, phthalo blue. This is indigo, which is always useful for darkening any green. Add a bit of indigo to it and that will make your green a lot darker. Um, then we've got may green and I'm going to Zoom up here to where I put that next to the um, Naples yellow. May green is a pretty vile colour, but it would be a good basis for darker greens if you mix something else, some other blue into it. Um, that is sap green, which is quite a useful colour. Straight from the tube you can use it. I always add something to my ready mix greens. They call them convenience colours because they're ready mixed but um, 
it sort of goes against the grain a little bit for me. I was taught to always mix my colours, so I tend to add something to the greens usually, and they do tend to benefit from that, I think. And that's olive green, which is useful. Probably the nearest to a green that you can use straight from the tube. Then we've got dark olive green, which is, uh, it's got phthalo green in it. And um, that's, it doesn't look like olive to me. It looks more like pine tree green. So it's a bit like forest green, isn't it? A bit like forest green or forest gump. This is cobalt turquoise, which is very thick and takes a lot of squeezing out. And then finally, uh, nearly finally, we've got brown umber, which is like raw umber in the traditional um, naming system. Raw umber, a sort of dark, uh, uninteresting brown colour. And then we've got black, um, which I haven't put any, I'm not going to put it out. I haven't put any black out yet and I don't think I'm going to be needing it at the moment. If I need it, I'll put it in a separate little dish and work with that. So there we are, the palette is all ready for work. So if, um, if you do do one of these cards swatched out, uh, all the colours like this, it's handy to have it nearby in case you forget what these colours are. You know, when you look at some of them, you can't really see whether it's um, purple or violet or whatever. So it's handy to have that. So not a bad idea to do something like that. It doesn't have to be as big as this, of course, and it certainly doesn't need to have the black line. That was just to demonstrate that they're not really particularly opaque. Opaque means that you can't see through it. As you can see, the Naples yellow is somewhat opaque. Um, the black is not quite so clear there, but most of the colours only have a slight amount of opacity and um, Paul Rubens do claim that they're pretty much transparent. So I think they are really. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some flowers and we're going to be using this as my reference, which I painted earlier today as a practice thing. And it's just um, so going to sit there. I'm going to use a block of etcher paper, glued all the way around so that it doesn't warp when you add water to the paper. This paper isn't bad. It's um, cellulose, I think, isn't it? Good pulp, yes. Um, but it's good enough for me. I'm not proud. I'm not a snob when it comes to materials. I paint on anything, with anything, and for anything, and anyone. And okay, so we're going to use these paints. I better move my coffee, haven't I? Um, we're going to use these paints and this is an opportunity to have a little, you know, um, explore of what we've got here. So I think I'll probably try out the reds and then I'll try out mixing some of the reds and see how we go. I don't have anything in mind at all apart from just to explore. Um, so let's paint. This is a very bright colour, this one, cadmium red. And so the way I do this is I bring a bit of paint out to the middle of the doodah there and I think to myself, hmm, that might be a little bit harsh. <laughs> Let's knock that back a bit with some other red. Um, we could I don't know, would we make, if we added some Indian red, I might say to myself, what colour would we get? And so we've got a sort of brown. So if we were to paint that really light, what would we end up with? A sort of pinkish brown. And, you know, you, you might like what you've created. That doesn't look too bad. So we would let that dry before we put the centre of the flower in. And then we will say, let's try something else. Let, I'm quite interested in this Indian red thing. So we take a bit more of that and mix it with some quinacridone uh, rose. And let's see what we get there. And I'm just painting little uh, four or five petaled flowers. 
I don't have any particular uh, color scheme in mind, um, but I might do a little bud here, like that. I might do another one up here in the first color that I mixed. And we've still got that first color here. So if we want to pick that up and do another one in, in that color, we can. And then we can go back to this one. We can make it a little bit. I wonder what would happen if we put um, quinacridone violet with Indian red. I need a little bit more water. Um, okay, so now we have a nice, soft, quite dark. Flower like that. And uh, maybe we'll put one over here. I'm using a number um, seven round brush here. This is a draw well from Japan. Uh, doesn't have to be draw well. Any round brush will do. This isn't, a, you know, this is this is not um, precision painting. I don't think. Let's go to the Perlin maroon and see what we have there. So I'm basically doing the same flower across the piece of paper and then we'll do some leaves afterwards. And I think I want something that's a bit more bluish in here. So I'm going to go to this end of the palette and pick up some blue violet perhaps and mix that with the quinacridone rose. And let's see what that is going to be like. That's going to be quite a nice dark red. So let's put one there. Remembering always that whatever colour you put down, it's going to, when it's dry, it will be a little bit lighter. So you might think it's too dark, but it uh, probably isn't. And then the second one that you paint with that brush full of colour, it's going to be a little bit lighter because you're running out of paint, so to speak. And uh, just try to paint them at different angles and so on. That one's not very good, but it doesn't matter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's got too many petals, but hey, whatever. Um, and then we might put um, some sideways on. Like that. And we'll put one over here sideways on. And maybe one here, just totally at random in the same color. And then maybe I'll go back to something a little bit lighter and do a few more buds. And we will put some green on here soon to give them more of a Uh, something to hold on to. And put another one down here. Try not to put too many petals. Um, yeah, I think that's enough of that one. I think. And then maybe I'll put one here. And then I was going to show you another method of painting flowers where instead of painting paint, you paint water. So just have a, a, a brush that's got clean water in it. I've used something that's just slightly pinkish there. So hopefully you'll be able to see. And then you pick up some pigment and you just drop it in to the point of the um, the petal that you painted in water and then you let it run 
and hopefully you get some kind of flower. I think I'm going to just join those together a little bit. I don't think I don't think I did that quite right. They're not quite wide enough. Do that one again. I'll let that dry and I'll do that again. I'm going to try it down here. One, two, three, four, five. And we'll just try that again. One, two, three, four, five. Can't count. Six. And we'll just let that run. <laughs> And then, of course, because you've done one, you've got to do several. So one, two, we'll put one here. When you do them like this, they, they are um, very random. So they're quite fun and they're just kind of additional bit of interest. And quite enjoyable to do. And you never really know quite where they're going to go. But on top of here, I'm going to do another one of the normal ones because I messed that up. So we'll just do a normal one on top. Okay. Then we have to wait for that to dry before we can do the centers. And then the next thing I'm going to do is turn my palette round because I'm going to do some green stems. And we will start off with olive green, I think. And um, then perhaps put some lemon yellow because lemon yellow is transparent. And that gives us a cleaner sort of green, a nice bright green like that. And then we can um, just using the very tip of the brush, draw in some stems. And then they don't need to join to each other. They don't need to touch one another. These are all uh, what was the word I used? Deconstructed. They're all separate. Okay. And then what we'll do then is we'll give them very fine little uh, flat little leaves just for a change. We don't normally do leaves like that, but if you Put plenty of paint on and the little line for the leaf, little um, spriggy leaf. You can let that run into the stem that you've just done because that's still wet. And that gives a nice effect too. Yeah. And I'm going to do the buds next. And the buds, we'll give them a little bit of something underneath and then some stem. And obviously we'll do some little leaves. And this one here. The 
still using the same um, green that I mixed that little puddle of. And if you want to, you can obviously change it as you go along. You don't have to stick with the same original mix, of course. Um, or if you want to go for a more kind of um, uniform look, you can stick with the same colour, but there we are. If I do that, we've got the leaves are a little bit darker and you can come back into where you've already painted and you can add some darker green and let that run. And that's also quite interesting and fun to do. Gives a bit more variety, a bit more looseness. Do it to some of them, not to all of them, for example. Um, you could, you know, do the little bits that are just behind the flower if you wanted to do those bits. You could do those in a darker colour. On top of the lighter colour, which always gives more variety as well. Okay, and then we can start thinking about the centres. And we probably want a sort of opaque orangey colour. So when I say opaque, I mean a little bit thicker. So let's think about the orange. That's a very nice orange, that Indian yellow. And we can stick that in to each of the flowers. That makes a nice contrast. That's on the other side of the colour wheel. This one lost its uh, centre, so we might, if I had white, I would paint some, well, maybe, no, I'll just, I'll just put, hmm, no, I won't. I'll tell you what, that one can have a dark centre. There's always a solution. And you might want to, you know, if you were doing accurate painting, you would make a bit more shadow around the centres, but you don't need to do that. I find that kind of thing a bit finickety, but some people like to do it. Okay, and now these ones that we did with the loose, um, the wet in wet ones, we mix up a bit more green. Um, rather than putting lemon yellow in, I might put a little bit of orange in just to change it up a little bit. Perhaps, Let's see what that looks like. And then we're gonna do nice little leaf shaped leaves there. like that. Um, did I only do three of them? One, two, three. Was that all I did? Looks like it. Uh, okay, so then, um, got quite a bit of space there. You can see how some of these colours are starting to just um, go back a little bit because they are um, drying. So if you want to, you can come back in again and reinforce the colour with another layer. And that will dry as well. And then you'll have a slightly darker centre. I know I said it was a bit finickety and it is, but if you do notice that they're starting to, to fade, and I'm afraid there will be Probably 30% fade back. Such a pity that watercolours do that. That's one of the attractions of acrylics because they don't do that. This one I might just do some little lines. And gouache, of course, dries darker than um, it starts out. So that's a different thing. And just emphasize the ends of these ones a little bit, perhaps. 
and then um, we could do a little bit of greenery, just greenery for greenery's sake. By which I mean, we'll go and get some darker green. So here I'm mixing olive green dark with my mixture of sap green and um, Indian yellow. And we've got a nice green and we will try not to smudge things. Let's just do some ferny types of things perhaps here and there. You won't really know what it's going to look like until you've done it. But that's the beauty of being a hobby artist, because it doesn't matter if you don't like what you've done. You can't say, you know, if you're retired, this is so wonderful, isn't it? Because you aren't wasting time. I mean, OK, you could have been doing the ironing. You could have been washing up. You could have been vacuuming or in my case you could have been mopping up a pot of coffee that your husband had accidentally spilt on the counter and the floor uh, and in the dog's bed and everywhere and you came downstairs in the morning to find him frantically trying to pretend it hadn't happened um yes anyway that was my morning but uh no, you, if you're a hobby painter and you're doing this for your own sake, you don't, if it doesn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out, then just do another one, All right? Okay, so I'm going to put some sprigs of leaves over here with round leaves as well. And one here. What happened was he put the, he always gets up before I do and he puts the coffee on. I've got one of those machines, you know, that just does it into a pot. And um, he put the coffee in and turned it on, but he forgot to close the front of it. So the coffee just ran onto the floor. Oh. We've had a, you know, over the years, we've had many of these things. Lots of coffee machine disasters. The exploding Italian espresso pot that hit the ceiling and blew a hole in it. The putting on the coffee without putting the pot underneath it at all and the coffee making itself onto the floor. You know. Okay, so there we are, that's that. And I now feel the urge to just do some, some little finickety circles, which I'm going to do here. And I'm going to um, double them up. And I'm going to do one with water beside it. So we get a sort of light and dark. One solid and one wet in wet. Hopefully. So I reckon I can probably do three or four of them before I have to come back and do the second one and still have it run. Oops. Um, one down here, perhaps. Uh, 
And there's about this time in the um, painting that you start to think, am I going to leave this the way it is or am I going to embellish it? You know, am I going to do um, anything on it with a pen? I, I don't think I will this one because this was mainly meant to demonstrate these paints. And um, I'm going. what I am going to do though is do a second layer of um, orange, yellow for the centers. That, I love that color. That is, I think I'm going to have to paint my kitchen that color. Just give it a little bit more of a dab like that. And you could, you could, um, you could do some circles in that color if you wanted to emphasize the yellow. Pretend that there were, you know, yellow flowers in the background, kind of thing. Like sort of give it a little bit more warmth because the blue, the red is a bit bluish, isn't it? It's a bit, a bit of a cold red, really. So that would sort of brighten it up a bit. Anyway, it's obviously millions of choices, and you could also, um, if you were feeling really, really detail oriented, you can come in and do some fine lines on some of these leaves if you feel that way inclined again remembering always that they will dry back a bit lighter and you can use a little bit of a contrast there and so there we are uh, not what you would call a uh, work of art to rival um, Monet but fun and took up some time filled up some paper, used up some paint. You could use this as a design for a card, of course. And it's just practice in using the paints, practice in using the brushes, you know, learning how to manipulate the brush the way you want to. And I can see some, some nasty brush work here that I wouldn't repeat next time. And um, yeah, so there we are. I'll let you go, play with this. And I'll see you again soon. So bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Oh, don't forget to subscribe, turn on notifications, and become a member. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.